The year was 2002. Anthony Enrique Gignac had just gotten out of prison for impersonating a Saudi prince when his family took him to watch the Steven Spielberg film, Catch Me If You Can. The film tells the story of legendary con artist Frank Abagnale and his elaborate check forgery scheme and his change to becoming an FBI fraud specialist. After watching the movie, Gignac gave it a unique review that completely ignored the story's point. Gignac said, I'm so much better than that guy. And just maybe, he was right. Before Gignac began impersonating Saudi royalty, he was an orphan child from Colombia named Jose Enrique Moreno. Gignac was born in 1970 during a tumultuous period in Colombia's history, the War on Drugs. The South American nation became a war zone between cartels and law enforcement. Gignac would have been forcibly enlisted into a cartel as a child soldier, if not for a couple in Michigan, the Gignacs, who adopted Moreno and his younger brother in 1977. The move to America changed Moreno in two significant ways. First is the wealth. Gignac had never seen so much money in one place. When Gignac and his brother first arrived, they supposedly ate like they were starving. Sadly, they probably were, and had been for most of their life. The second was the high status held by upper-class Americans. Gignac came from poverty and homelessness, so his perception of American culture was that of any other immigrant. A desire for something better, especially after seeing the rich of Colombia who towered over the lower classes in mountaintop mansions and sped by them in fancy sports cars. However, unlike most immigrants, Gignac's perception of status was warped from a very early age. Gignac believed that as long as he appeared wealthy and powerful to others, he could live the lifestyle of someone who actually is rich and powerful. In first grade, a six-year-old Gignac told his classmates that his family owned a historic hotel. Then, in second grade, he told them his father was the famous actor, Dom DeLuise. Gignac's lies reached a new level of audacity when his mother received a call from a local car dealership informing her that her new Mercedes was ready for pickup. However, Mrs. Gignac did not order a Mercedes. Their family was not wealthy enough to afford such luxuries, a fact 11-year-old Gignac was well aware of. That is why he walked into the Mercedes dealership claiming to be a Saudi prince. He said his father planned to buy the young prince a brand new Mercedes for his birthday. The dealership believed Gignac's story and even allowed him to test drive a couple of cars before deciding on which car to buy for his big day. When the dealership realized something wasn't right with their latest sale, they contacted the sheriff. Gignac's youthful scam was exposed, leading to Mr. and Mrs. Gignac sending their son to therapy. However, therapy was ineffective, and Gignac continued to lie about his social status. His psyche was further disturbed when his adopted parents separated, with each parent taking a kid. Gignac could not handle being separated from his brother and ran away from home at 17. His first stop was at the home of an Arab family in Michigan. Gignac convinced them he was a Saudi prince who needed a place to stay, and to ensure they took him in, Gignac told the Arab family if they did not provide housing for their prince, they should expect a visit from the royal family's secret police. While staying with his compliant hosts, Gignac got caught impersonating a Saudi Arabian arms dealer and fled Michigan. From there, Gignac ended up in Los Angeles, where the status-obsessed 17-year-old found himself in superficial heaven. Gignac spent much of his early days in LA, milking money out of limo companies, upscale Los Angeles hotels, and Rodeo Drive fashion clothing stores, all while pretending to be Saudi royalty. Ironically, while impersonating a prince, Gignac met a real member of the Saudi royal family. Gignac's claims of what happened during his encounters with actual royalty are just as bizarre as him running into a real Saudi prince. In 2007, Gignac faced charges for defrauding a limo company and using a credit card under the name Omar Khashoggi. Gignac testified in court that his interactions with the Saudi royal family had been the opposite of friendly. Gignac claimed the prince and other male family members performed certain acts with Gignac and subsequently paid him hush money. In other words, Gignac had a logical argument as to why the prince would want to keep him quiet. The incident led to Gignac carrying his royal fantasy to the next level. After his brush with Saudi royalty, Gignac changed his name to Khalid bin al Saud, who's an actual Saudi Arabian prince. With his delusion growing stronger, Gignac continued masquerading as a Saudi prince, now with the legal name to prove it. He hopped around California, Hawaii, and Florida, 
committing petty acts of fraud and spending short periods in jail whenever he got caught. Gignac routinely scammed free nights at five-star hotels and followed them up with a few weeks in jail once caught. After spending over 50 days in a Miami jail, Gignac found a new class of victims, wealthy Miami lawyers. Statistics show the average IQ of any attorney in the United States is 108, or 8 points above the world average. However, top-tier attorneys score at around 130, landing them in the gifted category. After scamming stores and hotels, Gignac started targeting attorneys in Miami. He enticed them with opportunities only the Saudi royal family could offer, which is a problem since he's Colombian. He tried to trick Yale graduate Johnny Cochran, who's also otherwise known by pop culture as the head attorney for O.J. Simpson's dream team. Gignac requested Cochran and his associates to meet him in jail to discuss his defense. However, Cochran didn't take the bait and decided not to take Prince Gignac's case. But even though skeptical attorneys shook their heads, there were several others who only saw potential. While sitting in a Miami prison, Gignac, now legally Khalid, began calling every attorney in South Florida, claiming he was a Saudi prince seeking representation. After much searching, Khalid's call was finally answered by ambitious Miami attorney, Oscar Rodriguez. Oscar saw an opportunity to help Khalid. The bondsman he hired to bail Khalid out of jail later said Rodriguez was mesmerized by the prospect of representing royalty, with the possibility of becoming the lawyer of the Saudi royal family. Rodriguez sent his two bondsmen over to get Khalid out on a $46,000 bond that was supposed to be provided by the prince's father. Of course, the funds never materialized, and Rodriguez told Khalid he would have to return him to jail. Ever resilient, Khalid devised a creative plan that would get him out of the pen. Khalid instructed the bondsman to take him to the American Express office to withdraw money from his family's account. Instead, when the bondsman dropped Khalid off, he rushed in and began crying out to the tellers that he'd been mugged and needed a replacement card. If they did not, he would call his father, the king. The tellers immediately believed him but had to ask him a security question before allowing Khalid to withdraw from the royal Saudi accounts. But what were the questions? To access the account, Khalid had to know the last two purchases made on the account's transaction list, a list the Colombian prince had never seen. Either Khalid had done his research or got ridiculously lucky because he answered both questions correctly and received a new platinum card containing a $200 million line of credit. After pulling off this stunt, Khalid had convinced the bondsman he was legit and confirmed Rodriguez's hopes of representing royalty. Caught in the throes of euphoria, Khalid took his bondsmen shopping. They rode around town in two limos, buying Rolex watches and other luxurious items. Even though Khalid still had to go back to jail, Rodriguez was hopeful about the future. One day, Rodriguez got a call from American. The express worker informed him that his client, Khalid, was not a Saudi prince and was currently committing fraud. At that same moment, his client was with his wife and daughter about to board a plane with first-class tickets in tow to New York. Rodriguez failed to catch Khalid at the airport, but captured the masquerading prince in his Four Seasons hotel room after hopping on the next flight to New York. Khalid tried to escape, but an enraged Rodriguez threw him on the ground. On their way back to Florida, Gignac almost got Rodriguez arrested at the airport after screaming that he was being kidnapped. Knowing a flight wouldn't pan out well, Rodriguez drove the prince to Miami in the trunk of a rented car. He returned Gignac to jail, recollected their bond, and left with the humiliating experience of being conned by the fake prince. Years later, when Khalid got out of jail, he used social media to keep his con going. Khalid began posting photos of himself wearing Rolexes and riding in fancy cars. Social media exacerbated Khalid's desire to flaunt his status as a prince. Many people genuinely believed Gignac was Khalid, especially now that he could prove his wealth with online pictures. This new level of fake legitimacy opened a new door for Khalid, an entryway into the wallets of the super rich. And the person who opened the door was a British asset manager by the name Carl Martin Williamson. Khalid first teamed with Williamson, a shady character in his own right, around the mid-2010s. Williamson was the kind of guy who seemed to know every famous person. He could even have them on the phone in minutes upon request. So, when royalty showed up with a nifty-looking 600 million bank account and a spoiled chihuahua, Williamson couldn't help but involve himself in the prince's scam. He set up an investment company for Gignac called Martin Williamson International, LLC. The thought of investing with the Saudi prince lured investors 
managers to throw almost $8 million at Williamson International. They believed they were getting a special friends and family pre-offer to a pending IPO for Armaco, a Saudi oil company. That, of course, was a lie. That IPO was valued at $2 trillion. By comparison, Apple's market cap is currently $2 trillion as of this video's publication. Williamson helped produce information that detailed the basics of Martin Williamson, like its logo, which prominently features a fancy crown, symbolizing its royal Saudi ownership. He also showed investors its convenient locations in both New York and Dubai. The information looked perfectly legitimate, and Williamson knew it would attract investors. However, this strategy was more ambitious, offer exclusive equity to wealthy individuals. Khalid gave the thumbs up by writing the official announcement for the IPO's public launch. He wrote about how pleased he was that he, his royal highness, was a player in the Saudi Arabian oil tycoon. As icing on the fraud cake, the company's logo bore a royal crown. The crown in Khalid's name carried a prestige that Williamson used to lure in potential investors. Their first taker was an investment banker in London who lent them $150,000. Writing that initial success, Martin International recruited 26 other investors who assumed the Martin Williamson company was an early capital funnel leading to the glorious Aramco. From those 26 investors, over $7 million was milked. Imagine you're a wealthy investor who wants the honor of being a shareholder of Aramco. Not only would you be involved with one of the most prestigious oil companies in the world, but you'd also be friendly with Saudi royalty. When meeting his victims, Gignac would pull up in a red Ferrari. His short and chubby body was covered in designer clothes and glittering jewelry. A lovely bowl haircut capped off the look. Buff security guards followed him in black suits, and his longtime companion Foxy, the Chihuahua, resided at the bottom of his Louis Vuitton purse. The show of wealth affected potential investors and helped cement the idea that they were indeed in the presence of royalty. They were obliged to pay this wealthy prince in gifts in exchange for his patronage. Khalid's last and wealthiest victim, Jeffrey Soffer, was no exception. Khalid showed up at Soffer's hotel in Florida with the audacious intent of buying an overpriced share of Soffer's business. Soffer, who comes from a long line of savvy businessmen, saw a chance to make a quick $140 million and wanted to begin negotiations right away. However, just like Khalid's other victims, the old money billionaire must pay the prince a worthy tribute. Throughout their negotiations, Soffer gave Khalid $100,000 in art and a $50,000 bracelet. He even invited the prince to his $29 million home in the snow-capped mountains of Aspen. At this point, Gignac is claiming to be next in line for the Saudi throne. Khalid happily accepts, hoping he can continue to milk more money out of Soffer during the visit. Instead, Khalid will make the most costly mistake of his conning career. During an upscale dinner at a popular Aspen restaurant, Prince Khalid ordered a dish that came with prosciutto, a cured meat derived from pork. Soffer immediately knew something was wrong with this so-called Saudi prince. The royal family of Saudi Arabia is famously conservative regarding their adherence to the Quran, forbidding the consumption of pork. Soffer alerted the State Department, which investigated Gignac. After the investigation revealed that Khalid was actually Gignac, the prince was arrested at JFK Airport and charged with an array of fraud crimes. Once the evidence was shown in court, Khalid received an 18-year sentence in 2019 that included an order commanding the trickster to pay $8 million in restitution to his victims. Click to watch one of these next videos.